Japan fears a silent outbreak is underway. And could the second time you're exposed to COVID-19 actually be worse than the first? Hello, everyone. Happy Valentine's Day. Wish I was here with a more pleasant topic to talk with you about. It is February 14th, 2020. This is your COVID-19 update. First, the numbers. These may well change by the end of the day. I'm recording this at about quarter after one here on Friday. And first up, here's what we see. Uh, reporting less, a lot less uh, cases than yesterday, plus 5,000. But guess what? We don't believe these numbers even slightly. Uh, there may be political reasons that this is being reported too low, or maybe they just don't know how to test or test enough or couldn't, even if they wanted to. 122 new deaths. But of course, the critical number is how many people are in serious and or critical condition. Now over 10,584 right there. Japan now has nine people in serious uh, condition. Of course, they had that one death yesterday that we talked about. Singapore still with eight in serious or critical condition. Hong Kong with seven people in serious or critical condition. And uh, much less going on elsewhere in the world. But we do have our concerns about whether there is a lack of testing uh, that is uh, contributing to the low numbers that we're seeing out here. It is our view that this has just started and that we're going to be living with uh, the coronavirus for quite a long time. There is just literally no chance of this thing, virtually no chance at this point of it just sort of dying out on its own, barring some miracle. All right, moving on. Uh, we have a Japanese taxi driver is diagnosed with coronavirus. That's the first case in Okinawa. And this was a woman, a taxi driver, had contact with Diamond Princess cruise ship passengers. So that's the ill-fated cruise ship with, uh, at last count, a um, little bit more than 6% of the people on board known to be infected. Still waiting to see all the people on board uh, tested to see if that uh, maybe gets to be a larger number. And uh, two more cases of coronavirus in Tokyo. We have uh, of those people that in uh, Japan that are actually in serious condition, eight of those from the cruise ship. And Singapore's prime minister, again, delivering the truth bomb, says the economic impact from the coronavirus outbreak has already exceeded that of SARS in 2003, says a recession is possible. I think there's no way to avoid that. We'll look at a little bit of economic data later. Uh, this is forewarning, fair warning, going to be a very meaty report today because I've got some medical sleuthing and a little bit of guesswork. And of course, as always, we're working from very incomplete data. This is non-peer reviewed. This is stuff that's likely to be revised. But so far, uh, we've been fairly successful at getting in front of the curve and giving you uh, information that's really uh, proven out to be right. And I, therefore, I think valuable for your planning and, and understanding of things. So uh, here from the Straits Times, uh, this is worrying about the stealth outbreak. Um, this is from Japan. So uh, the country's 36 and 37th cases, both linked to an infected Tokyo taxi driver. Okay, so that was the son-in-law of the elderly woman who died. So a couple more cases came out from that guy driving him around, I presume. And uh, he has now been reported to have attended a New Year's gathering on board a Yakatabuni boat last month. This is what's interesting. The domestic media is now citing experts, experts that's domestic to Japan, as wondering if a stealth outbreak might already be underway in Japan. And of course, that would be a very reasonable thing to worry about with something that has such a long, variable, asymptomatic, and infectious incubation period. Whew, that was a mouthful, but but that's where we are in the story is uh, understanding it at that level. And... Uh, Right now, there's a university professor as, uh, saying that efforts should be devoted to reducing the speed of contagion. Absolutely, efforts should be devoted to reducing the speed of contagion and treating the severely ill as an epidemic is likely occurring to some extent. Why do you want to reduce the speed of contagion? Because as soon as your hospitals are overloaded and overwhelmed and you've run out of critical uh, labor, and skills, and you've worn your doctors and nurses out, and you've run out of critical medical supplies, the case fatality rate is likely going to shoot from, I don't know, let's call it 2% under best circumstances to maybe 11 or more percent. And according to the Imperial College of London in Wuhan, might have spiked as high as 18% for those who present seriously to the hospital, not 18% of total, right? Um, None of these new cases have cited any recent overseas travel, let alone to Wuhan, the epicenter of the outbreak. So, of course, this has left the officials perplexed. Um, now they have a bunch of new cases. Guess what? This thing is now uh, in Japan. They've got an epidemic, which is a local contagion. That's what they're going to have to battle now, pretty sure. 
Yeah, not good news. 1,716 healthcare workers in China have been infected with the coronavirus, killing at least six. Health Commission says, again, I don't know how much stock to put in these numbers. I have very, very low faith in any of the numbers coming out of China at this point in time. But it's just interesting to see that they are reporting, gosh, you know, more than a thousand, you know, who knows how many, but lots of healthcare workers have been infected. Again, underscoring and reinforcing the idea this is a very infectious virus, transmits easily. Well, also wanted to bring to your attention the so called People's War on COVID 19 announced uh, by President Xi of, uh, out of China. And what's interesting is to see the, the lengths to which China is actually going here. Again, not a flu, not the SARS, the, the, the absolute draconian measures that have been undertaken tell you everything you need to know about really how serious this virus actually is. So uh, the interviewer is asking about being fascinated by the surveillance measures that China is using and talking about some of the ways that they're using to try and track people's movements and contain the outbreak. And uh, the answer is any of the ways they have on hand. They're doing everything from tracking license plate numbers across provinces to searching train manifests and airplane manifests for people who are passing through the epicenter of the virus. As you mentioned today, I'm in Shanghai. I've had to fill out this app with my personal details, my travel history for the last two weeks just to leave the train station and the airport mostly, though these surveillance methods you've mentioned are really low tech. It's local officials who now guard every village and apartment entrance, including mine, asking people where they're coming from, taking their body temperature. So, you know, really strong surveillance, just trying to get their handle, hands around and get a handle on this, this overall containment effort, which you have to go to these lengths if you want to do it. And particularly, though, when we look at the actual amount of uh, people who are now reporting in as having infected or been infected by or through someone who was asymptomatic, even these efforts are going to have to really uh, get much more draconian to get a get this under control. So what's really disturbing here, and I think you would maybe see this come to a theater near you if things got bad enough. Um, so they're talking about uh, people who must be rounded up are rounded up. And uh, so they're talking about uh, a Chinese official who said, uh, quote here, she's basically encouraging there for people to report anyone around them for mass quarantine. So report on your neighbors. That's unsavory behavior, and so officials in many places are offering bounties to do so. The most lucrative one I have found is in a city not far from Beijing, which now has a 14-day quarantine period before people who are coming into the city are allowed actually into the city. And they're giving up to 300 bucks to report anyone who's traveled from Wuhan to that city. In another neighborhood, they'll give about 80 bucks to anyone who reports someone with a fever. So asking the people to report on each other as well as self a report for quarantine, which honestly means reporting into one of those sick camps where your chances of catching the coronavirus probably shoot to close to 100% if you haven't already got it. Let's say you just have a normal flu or a normal fever for some other reason. You go there to one of these mass quarantine detention centers and you're going to get COVID-19. I want to talk a little bit about some market nonsense because our market, as I'm uh, uh, recording this right now, is also green again here in the United States. Stocks have just gone up, hitting all-time new highs all over the world. A lot of you have asked about that. Listen, I think they're just being used as a signaling device right now to say all is well because you can't analyze this and make a lot of sense of this. So um, look at this, a lack of workers. This is in The Economist. This is on February 13th. So, you know, markets had plenty of time. The markets have had plenty of time to digest this information. How about this? A lack of workers meant that after the end of the Lunar New Year holiday, Foxconn, that giant assembly plant, which makes most of Apple's iPhones in China, most of Apple's iPhones in China, could not get its assembly plants back to full capacity this week. Actually, they couldn't, pretty much couldn't get them to any capacity this week. Analysts reckon that the virus could lead Apple to shipping 5 to 10% fewer iPhones this quarter, and it could scupper its plans to ramp up production of its popular, and dare I say, profitable AirPods. So this normally, when you see a major company, particularly one with the market dominance like Apple, talking about a 5 to 10% ding to shipments, you some sort of effect would happen. Let's check and see what happened. This is the same uh, piece of writing here. Oh, would you look at that? In January 15th, Apple was at 314 a share. Now it's 10 bucks higher. 
even after this information came out and it was up in the pre-market. Of course, this is a pre-market uh, snapshot I took here. So that's uh, you can't fundamentally make any sense of that. Or perhaps more market nonsense, this is the airline edition. What do we got here? Uh, well, it's just um, the International Civil Aviation Organization has uh, looked at all the different uh, impacts that have happened around airlines not traveling and things like that. They're reporting that some 70 airlines have canceled all international flights to and from mainland China. And a further 50 airlines have conterned, curtailed related air operations. So who even knows what that means? Is that, that means that it's not just passengers, but probably freight as well uh, and cargo that has been impacted. This has resulted in an 80% reduction of foreign airline capacity for travelers directly to and from China and a 40% capacity reduction in total by Chinese airlines. This is a huge, huge hit to the airline industry. And let's talk about somebody that makes airplanes, Boeing. First, January, another month for Boeing without orders. This is so unusual, absolutely unusual. And for the first time in decades, first time in decades, Boeing recorded a negative order rate in 2019. Now, what do we know about Boeing's uh, share prices? Well, uh, first, it, it's up. It's up, uh, what is that, uh, 12 bucks here since uh, January 15th, so over the last month. It's gone up and it's it's higher. And you can't make any market sense of this. This, to me, again, is what has to happen if you want to create the appearance that everything is is okay and that you just stocks can't go down because then people would get nervous. And um, and that's really the only explanation that makes sense for this uh, at this point in time to me. All right, let's talk about this smoking and its relationship to COVID-19. A couple of interesting articles out there. So I dug through this. This is going to get a little sciencey. I like it. I think the science is uh, fascinating and it helps me feel better to know the mechanisms for why something is happening. So here we want to look at tobacco use disparity and gene expression of ACE2, which is the receptor that the uh, now COVID-19 a virus and also SARS virus that that's what it that's what it attaches to to get into the body. So this comes out of uh, Department of Environmental and Health Sciences at the University of South Carolina. So let's take a quick peek at this and see what we've got uh, coming out of this. All right, uh, here's all the data you need to know. Also, let me point out again, not peer reviewed, and this comes from February 5th. Here's the link if you want to get to it uh, more directly through the system. In the abstract, um, you know, they're talking about how they really want to get to uh, some sort of understanding of how and why different groups are susceptible. And so what they were looking at was gene expression. Now, so this is, let me decode that for you. Gene expression just says um, how much of this uh, DNA and then mRNA is being produced that would then get turned into the ACE2 receptor. It wasn't actually counting the receptors. So we don't know for sure that these um, receptors were actually expressed on the outer surface of the tissues, but we can tell you that the genes that are responsible for making sure that receptor is out there on the surface of the cell ready to bind a COVID-19 virus, were, uh, the genes were, were very much turned on and they found lots of this um, uh, gene expression. So no significant disparities in ACE2 gene expression were found between racial groups. Now, this flies in contrast to some of the earlier data that I put out, I think, on January 24th or 25th when we were first looking at this. So this is interesting, and I'm going to want to keep chasing this down and make sure if this is true, because this is, uh, uh, has very large explanatory power, uh, something that we really have to uh, bear down and see. Again, I'm going to want to get a lot of confirmation from this before we know for sure, but this is interesting. Uh, no significant disparities between found between racial groups, Asian versus Caucasian, or age groups, over 60 versus under 60, or gender groups, male versus female. However, the authors here observe significantly higher ACE2 gene expression in smoker samples compared to non-smoker samples. So that's interesting. So let's take a quick peek. Looking here at the global smoking map, uh, this might be sort of our, our view of, uh, don't worry, I'll give you a, a larger size version of this on the next uh, slide here, the next image. So this might give us a, a sense of where this uh, COVID virus might actually spread more easily and might be the next places for hot spots to emerge. It says here, nobody lights up like Eastern Europe, where the average annual consumption can exceed 2,000 cigarettes per person. Uh, and I presume babies aren't smoking. So this is a lot of cigarettes per person um, once that all gets averaged out. 
So um, fourth place, we got Russia, not far behind at 2,786 cigarettes per person per year. And so this is the, the base data here. So let's look at this map a little more closely. In red here, we got Russia you know, and um, Eastern Europe uh, clocking in at the highest level, 2,750 or more cigarettes per person. I don't know where you would draw the line and say um, too much is, you know, is it more than 1,200 cigarettes per year? Then all the places in green or uh, orange and red are going to be uh, problematic. We don't, we don't know. But certainly in China, which is here, it's this green color. It's at 1,500 to 1,700 cigarettes. And their males smoke a lot more than females. So here, it, you know, I think it's probably safe to say we could, if smoking's the issue, we probably at least could draw the line somewhere around there. And uh, gray doesn't mean anything. It just means they don't have data for these countries. So we don't really have a lot of information about Africa, except that of the places that is known, low smoking seems to be the name of the game. Um, and in Brazil, uh, fairly low smoking on average. But uh, otherwise, uh, that might give us a handle on this. So, so we'll just keep an eye on this. This may explain a few things. All right. The next is, I think we're starting to get some data and some information about why we're seeing the clinical symptoms we are and also how this may spread. And there's a lot of concern out there this this may be spreading um, out of fecal matter through the diarrhea that people express that that uh, once that gets down into the sewer systems or maybe in that hotel, sorry, that apartment complex in Hong Kong where uh, we studied that it was maybe moving through the pipes, you know. Uh, things like that. So I just wanted to talk about this because this is interesting data right here. This is the tissue distribution of the ACE2 protein. So they're looking at different tissues like heart, lungs, um, intestines, things like that. And uh, trying to find out where is this protein, which is the functional receptor for the SARS and also the COVID-19 coronaviruses. So this might be a first step in understanding what the pathogenesis might be. I want to highlight this part here. The present study investigated the localization of ACE2 protein, not the genes, but this is the protein itself. So this is the actual expression. This is a little bit more certain to go this way than studying the, the copies of the messages by which proteins get assembled. So the protein itself in various human organs. So they looked at oral and nasal mucosa, the nasopharynx, the lung, stomach, small intestine, colon, skin, lymph nodes, thymus, bone marrow, spleen, liver, kidney, and brain. I wish they'd also put heart in there, and I'll tell you why in a second. But uh, this is where they were looking. And the most remarkable finding was the surface expression of ACE2 protein on lung alveolar epithelial cells. So those are those deep ones in the lungs that, that are actually responsible for exchanging the gases. So there's a lot of surface expression of ACE2 on lung alveolar epithelial tissues and enterocytes of the small intestine. So... Um, we noted in some of the case studies so far of the patients that there had been uh, reports of upset stomach, of stomach aches, of diarrhea, things like that. This is consistent with that, meaning um, that, we're, that this where they found a lot of this A2, ACE2 protein expressed was in the lungs and in the small intestine. Furthermore, ACE2 was present in arterial and venous endothelial cells. The endothelial cells are the ones that line the insides of, of, in this case, both your arteries and the veins, right? And in the arterial smooth muscle cells in all organs studied. So this is not good news because it means that um, that ACE2 receptor is there and those endothelial cells that are lining your blood vessels. This is like the the, the little um, uh, lining on the inside of a water pipe that prevents the water from getting out. That's what those endothelial cells are. Uh, so that's uh, maybe helping to explain some of the things that we are seeing clinically start to show up, including difficulty in um, uh, people being able to uh, distribute oxygen cleanly throughout their body, um, some of the blood pressure things that have been noted, uh, things like the diarrhea, things like that. So let's just go just a little bit deeper because I want to talk about the heart issue because we've got some maybe potentially uh, very interesting, if not explosive news coming out about that. So what this did, uh, this study right here, here's your link to that. Um, I'm not going to decode all of this to you, but ACE2 is, is this little membrane protein here in green. And it sits there and it has a very important function as part of a, a signaling cascade mechanism. And it's a really complicated one. I'll show you a picture of it in a second because maybe pictures help. But um, it's really critically important in managing a number of 
uh, very vital body functions around um, heart heart functioning and uh, and managing uh, blood pressure and all sorts of things like that. So here, what they're showing in this study, which was interesting because it's fairly conclusive, the SARS protein, SARS virus. I mean, you could block that if you put in a bunch of these receptors. They would then bind to this and glob it up so it couldn't bind to the cell and, and come in. Or if you created an antibody um, against ACE2 and it would come in and block that. So they pretty well proved in this study that, yep, it's the ACE2 receptor. Yep, that's the that's the way in. But what was interesting here is because uh, I wanted to find this one piece of data. Um, polymerase chain reaction analysis, PCR analysis, reveals that ACE2 is expressed in the heart. Interesting. As well as the lung, kidney, gastrointestinal tract. Okay, so um, that heart is really important in this story as we go forward. All right, so let's go forward just a bit. Now, I've got a spilled salt shaker here. I need you to take this with a large, uh, several grains of salt, as many as you feel necessary, because um, this is coming out of Taiwan News, and uh, Taiwan is not known to be a big fan of, of China, so uh, first grain of salt there. Second, um, what we're dealing with here is a uh, is a is a basically secondhand news that can't really be verified, but it's it's could be true, and it rang a couple of truth bells, so I'm raising it here with you today. Chinese doctors say Wuhan coronavirus reinfection even deadlier, and that's something that's been of concern to me for a while. And so this came out right here on February 14th. So it's fresh news. Uh, the report reads, it's possible to get infected by the novel coronavirus a second time, according to doctors on the front line in China city of Wuhan, leading to death from heart failure in some cases. And so we've seen the videos of those people sort of just sort of keeling over, um, which uh, that could possibly signal something from heart failure. We've seen the people in, um, going into violent uh, tremors and uh, convulsions, again, that could be indicative of heart failure or something leading to a heart arrhythmia that, that's uh, causing those sort of symptoms. Maybe. We don't know. But we'll find out. Uh, the claim is made by doctors working in the Hubei province capital that is at the center of the epidemic. One of the doctors reached out to a relative living in the United Kingdom who then informed Taiwan News. So A, we're playing a game of telephone. Doctor called a relative, called Taiwan News. B, we can't confirm any of this. So there's the salt shaker. But something interesting here to, to discuss if this is true. According to this message, uh, there's a quote here. So I think this is a quote, a direct quote from that doctor. It's highly possible to get infected a second time. A few people recovered from the first time by their own immune system, but the meds they use are damaging their heart tissue. And when they get it a second time, the antibody doesn't help but makes it worse and they die a sudden death from heart failure. The source also said the virus has outsmarted all of us. It can hide symptoms for up to 24 days. And also the source said that false negative tests for the virus are fairly common. So we're getting lots and lots of reports of those false negatives to start at the bottom of this and work back up to the, to the main uh, point of this article. Those false negatives could be because the tests are bad. It could be because the virus is not is in the body, but it's not at detectable levels. It could be for all sorts of reasons, but these false negatives are showing up all over the place. We're seeing it on the cruise ship data. We're seeing it all over the place. So just because somebody's been in quarantine 14 days, just because they've had two negative uh, PCR tests for the coronavirus does not mean that they are necessarily free from the disease. This idea of sudden heart failure, though, this comports with, remember, yesterday we were talking about how the attempt to make a vaccine for SARS had led to a successful vaccine. It, it caused antibodies to be developed within the body. Everything was fine until those animals in the animal studies got re-exposed to SARS, in which case their body went crazy on them and killed them uh, because of the cytokine storm that developed. Their own bodies uh, had that immuno pathology, that your immune system creating its own pathology. It wasn't the virus itself. It was the body's overreaction to it. So this is starting to fit with that narrative. Again, early stage, just trying to assemble uh, some really fuzzy dots into something that looks like a picture, but we'll get there over time. This is, uh, I can't tell you how much uh, stock I place in this. I found it on the internet, uh, So, but I wanted to bring it to you because it fits sort of with this. Uh, allegedly confirmed by an official CCP source, coronavirus attacks your heart and is harder to treat than SARS. Here's the video conference link. So if anybody can uh, translate that, this is the translation that it was offered. I can't verify it myself because I do not speak uh, Mandarin. 
Compared to the 2003 SARS, the progression of respiratory failure is much faster, lack of oxygen more evident. Coronavirus is, nope, um, coronavirus, uh, yeah, it's not is a severe form of acute respiratory stress syndrome, but can lead to, it's, uh, that's, yeah, coronavirus leads to a severe form of ARDS. Uh, the heart of patient also get very severely attacked by the virus and um, saving and healing patients with this coronavirus much more challenging than SARS and normal acute respiratory distress syndrome. So let's talk about why that might be. And um, there's two mechanisms we're going we're gonna to go through now. The first, really complex biology. So there's this, I brought this up a number of days ago and talked about angiotensin. It's a polypeptide. It's just a series of amino acids. And it's a very important signaling molecule in your body. And your body does a whole bunch of things with it because biology is complex. And one of the things is angio. Tensinogen right here can actually be converted by this enzyme renin, and it becomes angiotensin 1. And ACE2 would take that angiotensin 1 and turn it into this different molecule, and it goes down this pathway. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. Or the angiotensin converting enzyme will bring it down here and convert it into angiotensin 2, which is just another cleaving of this polypeptide into, into different fragments. Again, ACE2 comes to the rescue pushes it over onto this side, turns it in, over into angiotensin 1 through 7, and then it comes down this pathway. Now, if it comes down this pathway, hey, we get all this great stuff, uh, anti-fibrosis, anti-growth, anti-inflammation. These are all things that are associated with a healthy state. But if ACE2 isn't here to convert this pathway's stuff over into this pathway, it comes down this pathway, and what do we see? vasoconstriction, fibrosis, which is uh, the creation of like scar tissue, if you will, um, inside of uh, organs, hypertrophy, which is a, an overgrowth of, of the cells and um, the state of a particular thing, a hypertrophic heart, for instance, is enlarged compared to normal, and inflammation, right, which is, again, part of that immune response, which is too much, too, too far, too fast, all of that stuff, that inflammation is um, part of that cytokine storm is a, sort of an inflammatory pathway, if you will. So at any rate, uh, this will all be on the test tomorrow. Um, I just wanted to bring up this complexity for you to, uh, to talk about a couple of things. Um, uh, the first, the first is that um, this ACE2 is just a part of a pathway, and it creates it turns this uh, angiotensin 2, which again, remember angiotensin 2 brings you down this pathway. ACE's job is to bring it over to this other pathway. Um, and here we can see in a cardiac fibroblast, so you've got myo, uh, myocytes in the heart, which are the actual ones doing the pumping, and then there's other supportive cells in there. A fibroblast is one of those. And just, I know this is maybe a little hard to see, but here's how this works. This angiotensin 2, right, if it comes into this, into your, gets in through this receptor, it comes in and it leads to things. Um, it's circulating around and it's telling your heart to do certain things, including go into cardiac fibrosis, that scar tissue that, that is turning into more fibrous rather than uh, a healthy muscle tissue. What stops that? Well, if this angiotensin 2 comes along and encounters one of these ACE2 receptors, it gets converted into angiotensin 1 or through 7, goes in through this particular um, docking protein, and it blocks it. That's what that little tiny line there is. It's blocking that pathway. So this is an unhealthy pathway. It's for, it's for repair, and it's an emergency. But this pathway with ACE2 in it is a healthy reparative pathway. And again, we see that same thing in the endothelial cells. Again, those are the ones lining your blood vessels. Um, both the arteries as well as the, the veins. And uh, same thing. Um, it's either going down one pathway or it's coming down another pathway based on whether or not ACE2 is there. So there's a second um, pathway here that we want to talk about. A uh, little complex, but I can make this simple for you. See these red lines? These red lines are bad. These are the unhealthy ones. And so if you go down the angiotensin 2 pathway... You get all these red lines, which all sort of converge on heart failure. And if ACE2 is there to convert this angiotensin 2 to this one, angiotensin 1-7, these all are blocking functions. That's what that little line is, block, 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 block. 
So what would be blocked or alternatively, what's not blocked? So if ACE2 isn't there, you have pressure overload and hypertension in the heart. You get this cardiac hypertrophy, which is this enlargement of the heart. You get this cardiac fibrosis, which is a scar tissue, if you will, around the heart. A little inaccurate, but, but close enough. Um, post-myocardial infarction remodeling. Again, if you have angiotensin 2 in there, you have increased cell death. You have cardiac fibrosis, decreased contractility, all that stuff, right? Diabetes, we're also getting uh, data that diabetics are uh, getting hit a little bit or a lot harder by this particular uh, virus. And again, it's because of all these things such as inflammation, lipotoxicity, endothelial dysfunction, all bad things to happen, which again, if you have too much circulating angiotensin 2, that would contribute to that uh, process. And for obesity, same sorts of things, myocardial lipotoxicity, um, metabolic abnormalities, insulin resistance, all of these things leading to heart failure. So I'm ready to just sort of throw something out there, postulate that there are two things that make this so difficult to treat, which really conform and confirm, conform with and confirm what that uh, uh, um, Chinese doctor was saying, which is it's so dangerous because first you have this cytokine storm. That's a big part of why this thing is so damaging. We're worried that the second time that you see this is actually when the cytokine storm kicks in. But it also unbalances a critical hormone system, the ACE2 system. And maybe that's contributing to what we're seeing as well clinically. So it's it's the combination of both of these things. I don't know which would be more important at this point. I'm just raising some of the science so um, we can explore it and talk about it. Here's the big checklist. And if you've been following along, I've just been adding things in yellow to it over time. All of the stuff that's in white has pretty well been confirmed up to this point in time. And now we have to add a couple questions here. Does smoking make it worse? Smoking makes it worse. Yeah, we think so. The data looks pretty good so far. We're going to see if we can get that to be confirmed. Uh, and that your second exposure could be worse. Now, the normal way this is supposed to work is that uh, you get exposed to a virus, you develop antibodies to it, and now you're immune. That's the way this is supposed to work. But maybe there's something different or wrong about this particular virus, which would make it not dissimilar from the Spanish flu, where the first wave was bad, but the second wave that went around the world was a lot worse. So conclusion for today, the people's war in China, that's just not consistent with the flu. Absolutely not. That's consistent with them fighting something very dangerous that they're very worried about as well. The markets, which I put in quotes here, because actual markets involve buyers and sellers. Fake markets uh, just involve propping and, and signaling by authorities so that they can use it to um, create the appearance of normality, which I get, again, totally understand why they're doing that, even if we don't agree with that. We think the long-term damage to the markets may outweigh the temporary benefit of presenting um, an all is, all is well happy face. But again, that's just not consistent with the flu, right? Absolutely not. We think that it's correct. That Japan is correct that a silent outbreak is probably underway lots of places um, because of the asymptomatic period, also because of a poor ability to test, also because a lot of the tests deliver false negatives in the early going. There's a lot of reasons why a silent outbreak could be underway despite the best of medical intentions and uh, testing capabilities. We also noted here today that the ACE2 receptors seem to be increased by smoking, that that upregulates that pathway. You get more ACE2 receptors. Of course, that would make you more susceptible to uh, getting hit by the virus because it has more ways to land in your body if you have more places for it to land. Two possible ways I'm proposing here today that COVID-19 creates harm. One, the cytokine storm as discussed. And maybe it's this, uh, maybe it's a grotesque unbalancing of the angiotensin slash ACE2 pathways, um, which could have uh, sort of hormone effects that, that could be part of this too. And then the big question, which we're going to be really exploring because this has enormous implications for how I personally prepare and how a lot of people will be preparing is, could the second exposure actually be the more deadly of the two? And we're just going to have to keep digging. So with that, I'm your faithful information scout. I would like to remind everybody that we are having a live Q&A Saturday, um, February 15th. And if you're listening to this after that point in time, you can always catch a, uh, a recording of that video. Um, it's a Zoom call, and we're going to be answering a lot of questions from our uh, members over at Peak Prosperity. Otherwise, come by Peak Prosperity. If you like this, please uh, subscribe here, share it. And then come by Peak Prosperity, uh, where we're having very extensive conversations about this and all the other videos. Thank you. 
and good day.